At 78 years old, actor and award-winning author James McEachin shows no signs of slowing down as he tours the country with his one-man play, Above the Call, Beyond the Duty. James is joining us backstage in the studio to talk about his new play and to share reminiscences from a lifetime of experiences and a career spanning the past 50 years. Please stay tuned for Aging in L.A. A veteran of the Korean War, James McEachin was awarded the Purple Heart and the Silver Star and is a tireless advocate for veterans. As we'll hear from James today, his new play offers a poignant journey through one man's perception of patriotism. We'll also be talking about his varied career in the entertainment business, which includes having been a record producer for artists including Otis Redding and The Furies and his pursuit of acting, which saw him starring regularly in television programs such as Murder, She Wrote, Perry Mason, Hawaii Five-0, and Dragnet. He also appeared with Clint Eastwood in the film Play Misty for me. James, welcome to our show. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> what a treat. I can't wait to get involved in this. You've done so many things with your life. Well, for 21, I've done a few. <laughs> <laughs> for 21 years yeah. old. Now, 78, uh, hey, you were born at a certain time when our country was a lot different and uh, segregation was a reality. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So when you went into the service, was that something were you running from something or was that an opportunity for you? i think i was running to something it was not i was running to an opportunity mm -hmm. i uh, uh my my uh, brother-in-law came home um, uh, uh i was living in new jersey and uh he had this uniform on and it meant something my god wow. i mean look at that you know yeah and i wanted so much to be a part of uh, uh of the military and then uh, when i became 17 i uh, you know i joined Wow. Yeah. And then ended up in, in southern Japan. Now, you had to stand out in southern yeah. Japan. Well, <laughs> no, the whole outfit did. Uh, oh, I was with the 24th Infantry Regiment, and mm -hmm. uh, we were with the occupation forces there and, right. uh, and, and, uh, in Gifu, uh, Japan. And the army being as segregated as it was at the time, the white troops went uh, to uh, Yokohama and Tokyo and places like that, sure. Osaka, Shippuro, and uh, the blacks were relegated to... Uh, to uh, uh, yeah, but then came a shooting war in Korea. Yeah, uh, uh, th th three, uh, three or four years later, mm -hmm. uh, you know, shooting war. But by that time, I was back in the States, and they started that war behind my back. <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> oh, I, I was a little incensed about that, and so that's why I yeah. re-enlisted uh, to, uh, to, uh, to go to Korea. Well, I, I mentioned earlier, of course, uh, to getting a Purple Heart, so obviously you were injured, and I understand it was a pretty serious injury. Yeah, in fact, I'm still walking around here as a souvenir, well, with a souvenir from, from that uh, mm -hmm. injury. I have a, a bullet right in here, and, I, and uh, just about two years ago, the shrapnel, which was in my thigh, started affecting me, oh. and I was walking with a little limp for a well, while. Well, you set off those airport uh, Hello, machines. Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> but this journey then uh -huh. became something else so we're here in the middle 50s mm -hmm. what happened with your life once you separated from the service that did you stay pay, stay in touch with your with your guys from the unit no not not really in fact uh, there's only one guy even today i give him a buzz every you know every major holiday uh -huh. christmas and, and uh, uh new year's or birthday or something like that i i, I give him a buzz to mm -hmm. see how he's doing uh, but no, I didn't stay close to them. In fact, what I wanted to do, I wanted to make a career out of the military, but what happened at the time, uh, there were two reasons why I didn't. Number one, I thought the Army was still so biased that, uh, that sure. you couldn't get a fair shot. Yeah. And then secondly, my injuries were such that I didn't think that I'd be able to, uh, to do most of the duties that were, that were required at the time of a, of a good infantryman, which I was. Yeah. And so I ended up, um, I was living in New Jersey, and um, so they, they were giving this test, civil service was, uh, for a, a policeman and fireman in, in the city of Hackensack, New Jersey. So I took the test and, and passed both of them with flying colors. I see. And then I uh, eventually, uh, I wanted to be a policeman. 
but the fire department, but the, the, uh, they were making the fire department, uh, the, the fire department appointments first, and so I uh, became a fireman. Were, they were integrating at this time? Or uh, uh, not quite. Oh, the civil me. service this is, <laughs> is going to be separate again. <laughs> oh yeah, no. separate but equal. Uh, so uh, the police chief came around my house one night, uh, uh, extolling the virtues of uh, the police department. Mm -hmm. The fire chief was extolling the virtues <laughs> of the police. Jeez. And so he, they didn't want any blacks on that department at all. And so since I came out number one on the test, I said, well, I think I've become a fireman, knowing damn well that that would be the most boring job in the world. <laughs> and so I just took it just to... <laughs> oh, just to spite him. Just to spite him. Huh? Just to spite him <laughs> I like that. You know, and I know he, and he was really mad about that, too. Really? The, of the choice you made? Oh, yeah. But I only stayed on the fire department for yeah. six months, and then I transferred over. To the police department. Now, I know we're going to talk about this later, mm -hmm. but the role of choices that you've made in your life, do you ever feel like somebody up there is giving you a sign and a signal, like, James, time for you to take a oh, different path? Oh, if, if it had been for this guy upstairs, I'd be in San Quentin today. <laughs> some of the things yeah. that I've done. But isn't it astonishing? I, I mean, you have to look at your life and go, I'm surprised. <laughs> I, 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 absolutely. Amen. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. But tell me, tell me, how did you become so involved with veterans, with their issues and their concerns? What happened? Well, Paul, I'd, I'd like to be noble enough to say that uh, I wish my life had been noble enough to say that I'd always been involved in veterans' issues, but, I, but, but, but that wouldn't be the truth. What happened was that I, like so many veterans, swept my military service under the rug and never even thought about it. Mm. Um, particularly after I migrated to the acting business. And uh, it was only after I had gone back to the hospital and, and my old war wound had acted up that I thought about the fact that I had, uh, uh, you know, uh, had spent some time in the, uh, in the military and mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, that I was wounded. And, and another thing that kind of hurt me a little bit in that direction is that um, I never got some of the medals until 50 years later. Uh, which, uh, yeah, but that, it, 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 a lot of people thought it was racial, but I don't think so, mm -hmm. uh, simply because of the act, the, the Army um, had a way of uh, just overlooking, conveniently overlooking some outfits yeah. and, and awarding medals. Yeah, but and you just didn't get involved. You wrote a play about this. I oh, mean, yeah, but that, but that was, yeah, but that was later on. I mean, mm -hmm. my God, I'd, I'd done 150, <laughs> almost 200 television shows and all that stuff oh. after that. And... Uh, and, but and, to get to get back, mm -hmm. suddenly you find yourself in a facility, or were you around other veterans then, and and you became concerned for them, and and well, uh, yes, but at the same time, uh, um, they were doing, they would, they were having the 50th anniversary of the Korean War, mm -hmm. and a, a friend of mine, his wife, uh, Judge Will Ross, uh, his wife had asked him, did did she know anyone that was a veteran mm -hmm. of the uh, Korean War? And it just so happens, he said, yeah, my good friend James McKeachin is a veteran. Well, most people are kind of surprised to know that I was even close to the military, <laughs> let alone being a veteran of the Korean War yeah. and having won a medal or two. So she called me and asked me if I would represent the, uh, uh, go to Washington to represent the Korean War vets, and boom, 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 one thing led to another. And, uh, and then I found out that it was almost like a calling, Paul. It was the big guy upstairs calling yeah. again and said, hey, pal, go over there do that and yeah. uh, one thing led to another and then I started writing speeches and uh, it led to a play well and and yeah I, yeah, I know that feeling you kind of look over your shoulder and realize nobody's going to substitute for Amen. you, Absolutely. <laughs> so you know? this is your job and you say where does it come from you've got to explain how you get into the acting world you know people would they they would cut off their leg to be part of the acting profession but you just kind of fell into I, I it. just breeze into it I just, honestly God I was walking down the street on Melrose Avenue one day but <laughs> I was it just happened I, to be I, I was going up to see a, a friend of mine by the name of Jordy Hormel uh, who's the son of the Hormel meatpacking uh, right. people, and I had to be going on the sidewalk, unemployed again, incidentally. Uh, I had left New Jersey, left the, the, fire, the fire department, obviously, and the police department, and ended up here in the hospital at uh, Olive View. Mm -hmm. right. And I stayed in Olive View for a year, had an operation, because uh, I had uh, contracted TB from the wound that I'd received over in Korea. Right. And uh, when I got out of the hospital, uh, had to find some sort of... Uh, a job. I decided I'd go up and see Jordy. What had happened? He had written a script, and uh, he had he wrote um, something about a musician, and 
It just so happens I was in music at the time, uh, or, or at least I was trying to be. Uh, and uh, so he, when we went across the street to the little restaurant that they had in front of Paramount Studios, yep. you remember that little chili yep. joint? Yep. Uh, <laughs> he sprung Oblats. Oblats, <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Good God, what a memory well, you Well, I did uh, Houseboat there with Cary Grant and Sophia Loren, 57, so I kind of know the area. But How go was ahead. Sophia? And I want to talk about uh, that. That's <laughs> after. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, you went over to Oblats. Yeah, and here, yeah, we had the, the bowl of chili, I'll never forget it. And then yeah. he took me across the street to, um, which was still next door to my friend's office. And uh, um, the guy said, uh, asked me to read. Uh, and you could read? Well, I didn't know what read when you're in a, you know, to, to, to read when you're an actor or in the acting, in the acting profession. Reading is different than can you read. Yeah, well, but if you're a real person, you have a big leg up over most actors. So I read this I read this part. I said, I, he wanted to hire me. And so I said, I don't, you know, I, I don't think you're making a huge mistake here. So I took the script, threw it in the trunk of my car, and I forgot about it. And about a month later, the guy called me and said, hey, what about that See? script you said you want to do? And I called my wife. Uh, my wife was in the kitchen. I said, "This guy's on the phone. He want me to do. He want me to be in this movie." And she said, "You might as well. You bombed out and everything else." Uh, wow! <laughs> always but him. you know, who whoever knows that was is this the same kind of process that took you into the music business? Because yep. you were there at a very lively time oh, you know, when yeah, things good, were happening. Yeah, in the yeah, music. Yeah, it was a good time. Bob Keen was over there. Oh, uh, beyond Otis Redding, of course, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, the Furies, and uh, it was in Sam Cooke and all the rest of those oh, people. Just a man. wonderful oh. one. I love yeah. Sam Cooke. You know, th yeah. that was an era when we were finally learning that we could go down to South Central <laughs> to some of those great clubs, and mm -hmm. that Sam could come up into Hollywood and come to some of our good clubs. Yeah. And Lou uh, Rawls. Oh, Lou Rawls. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Yeah. Just wonderful, talented people whose talent elevated so them hard. above all the rest. Yeah. It was fantastic. Jazz uh, pianist. Uh, uh, Absolutely. Uh, uh, yeah, I can remember the first time I went to a jazz club. I wasn't old enough to go in, so I had a little table in the alley behind the joint, <laughs> <laughs> but I could hear the music. Yeah. That, Les now, McCann was a jazz oh, pianist. Jeez, like all, all yeah. of these yeah. guys. Now, were you involved in the music scene in any other way other than you No, you just producing it? and all that, and yeah. then I got lucky enough to get a job over at Liberty Records, and uh -huh. they summarily fired me about... Oh, jeez. Uh, uh, you want to know why they fired me? Which I, I think was I'm very, gonna very interesting. I'm going to get to it when we come okay. back. Hang on just a second. We have to take a short break. Now, when we return, we'll continue our backstage conversation with James McEachin on Aging in L.A. Friends, we'll be right back. In the case of a disaster, you need to be able to communicate with emergency personnel and your support network, as well as to stay current with the latest information. For additional information, Please contact the Department on Disability or the Emergency Management Department by calling the numbers on the screen or by dialing 311. Before approaching an intersection, so that's why two wrong turns don't make a right turn. Now let's learn about tailgating. Hey, that's how I got my ticket. You got a ticket for tailgating? That's not good. That can be really annoying. Didn't get you there any faster. It leaves you no distance to break. Which makes it easier to get into a crash. And it also may increase your insurance premium. And I hate tailgaters. Tailgating causes crashes. Back off. Watch the road. Welcome back to Aging in L.A. And our fascinating guest today, actor James McEachin. James, you just started to tell me about you got a job at Liberty Records and then you were fired? Oh, yeah, well... Things happen, Paul. <laughs> you, know, you know why they fired me? No. Because I was given the assignment to bring Gene McDaniels back. Gene McDaniels, uh -huh. if you remember, oh, sang sure. a song. He had 100 pounds of clay. Yep, he took 100 pounds of clay. Oh, we could be And doing he said, hey. <laughs> yeah, right. Hey, listen. Yeah, but, yep. but Gene was a handful to work with. Really? And, uh, yeah, well, the mafia was going to hang him out the window and, oh. and break his neck because oh. he owed them some money. Those right? were the days. But huh? they wanted someone to bring it back, and I'd had a hit record with the Furies on Sing with the Strings of My Heart, mm -hmm. you know, which we did a kind of uh, up to the R&B. Yeah, you everything. really did. Yeah, yeah I like remember that because the Marcells did the same thing with Blue Moon. Yeah, yeah right, 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 right. Exactly, same yeah. era. 
Okay. Headed back anyway, to so so I found the one song that I, that I knew that Gene would uh, would want to do because Gene wanted to. Uh, Gene fancied himself as being Frank Sinatra. He yeah. didn't want to do saloon just the saloon singer. A saloon singer. That's know, what he wanted to be, right? Yeah. So every time I presented with a song, he would turn it down, and then he and Liberty would be at odds again, and so we compromised. And so and so they asked me to find something that would be a middle of the road for it. So I found this tune, and I played it for the head of the company. Um, um, what the heck was the name? Don Blocker was the head of a and r And uh, so I said, I got to record this song on Gene because I know if he doesn't, boom, we got to smash. So they wouldn't, get me, they wouldn't let me record it because of, uh, uh, they said it was a hop hit song. Right? Oh, so I go down geez. to, uh, so I fake the budget, go down to RCA when RCA made that new studio. Uh, uh, you remember they were on Sunset and Vine yes, and they sure were the one yeah. uh, the block down. And so I recorded the song, got Gene Page, that great arranger, to arrange it, go to the studio and record this song, and I'm just knocked out. Our, at our Monday morning A&R meeting, Artists and Repertoire, uh, where all the producers play their product for the head of the company and for the sales force, I played, my, they, Snuffy Garrett got on, he had right. adventures, oh, and they played their stuff, for, um, uh, <coughs> and some of the other A&R men who name I can't so remember at the moment. was it great? Was it a good tune? Yes, I got, so when I, uh, they played their thing, and then, I go over to the uh, to the record player and I put mine on. Table those yeah, days. yeah. Oh, and turn <laughs> and put mine on. And there's Gene. That's life. That's uh, what people say. You... So I recorded the song. That's what I recorded on it, right? Wow. Uh, before the song the song got into uh, the chorus line, boom, I was fired. Out the door. I was out mm, the door, mm, right? Mm, and I'm mm, playing mm. the song real loud in my office as I'm packing up, getting ready to to, to leave, and. Uh, 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 Jimmy Bourne comes by my office and said, oh, what's that song you're playing? I'm saying, that's, uh, that's Life by uh, Gene McDaniels. He loved the song. He said, this is great. Wow. He took it to Sinatra, recorded it, and, and a couple of days later, I hear yeah. the thing on the uh, Columbia Records. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. What a, yeah. that's oh, he, an amazing yeah, story. He recorded, uh, 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 he recorded was it on Reprise, the, then? Reprise, reprise yes, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, now, I've got to talk about your play because uh -huh. it's making a mark. People are seeing something real and earnest about it. Tell me about the play. What, what does uh, 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 Above the Call or Beyond the Call mean to you? Uh, above, Beyond the Call means that the, the man, the character, the old soldier, is beyond the call of uh, earthly uh, duty. Uh. What happens is that, uh, and it stems from uh, a DVD that we did uh, oh, about two or three years ago called Reveille, and Reveille, uh, uh, it was placed on the internet and has thus far got, uh, got, uh, garnered about, uh, around uh, uh, three million hits. Wow. How was it like on YouTube? Uh, oh, it's uh, yeah, YouTube Google. Yeah, you can Google, Google, it? Okay. Google that Reveille. And, uh, okay, Reveille. God, I, get mail. That, yeah. I get mail from all over the world. It's about wow. an old soldier and you know the actor David Huddleston. I yes. play the old, old, I play one old soldier and, and, uh, and Huddleston plays the, uh, plays the other. Uh -huh. And uh, we have a contest about raising the flag. Wow. Uh, each, each morning, and my character dies. Well, I picked that up uh, from uh, from from Reveille, uh in a play called uh, in in a, in a short DVD called Old Glory, mm -hmm. where I see that the guy is uh, he is being buried, and, and he rises up from the coffin uh, to go and get his uniform and to get oh. his American flag because he doesn't want to be taken away or leave this good earth. Uh, uh, in, in a civilian uniform. Wow. Well, this he he wanted his American flag. And from that part, I go to the play where we see this guy, the old soldier. He's in God's waiting room, so to speak. He's on his way to, uh, uh, to talk to God, and he encounters his grandfather. And his grandfather tells him, he said, I don't want you going over there talking to God about, uh, about your time in the military. You talk to God. I mean, God knows all about your time in service. He doesn't need you to tell him about that. He was there. He was watching mm -hmm. you. Right? And he goes on to say that... Uh, uh, you tell God what you were thinking on your way to becoming a soldier. That's what God wanted to hear. What were you thinking? And so that ex uh, opens the story up. It's, this is really uh, your, this is you doing honor to this country. What is, patriotism is kind of, to many young people today, is sort of passe. I, how, how do you feel about this country, which, let's face it, you were treated unfairly in several instances, culturally, socially. What does it mean to you? 
I think I have the old soldier saying something. I can answer that question if I can quote. Sure, a, please. A, a, a little bit from the play. He says, as a soldier, I traveled the world. And even after my time in uniform, I could be found going hither, thither, and yon. But each time there was always something tugging at me, saying, see the world, son. Home is where the heart is. And each time I returned to these shores, I returned with a greater sense of hope and optimism, knowing well that this young country, burdened by noble ambition and costly wars, and shackled by homegrown issues that will not soon go away, still America is not so much of a place as it is a blessing. And I am going to miss her terribly. Wow, thank you. I've got to come see this. Um, I, there's just not enough of these sentiments uh, right away. Uh, let me give you a little better taste of this. Let's take a short trip to the Brentwood Theater where James was performing his one-man play, Above the Call, Beyond the Duty. They'd be about the universe, his world, as he termed it. And Gramps would tell these stories as if he had stood at the right hand of God. And I would, I would, I would be right here, looking up right here, I would be, down here. And I'd look up at his leathered old face, and then I would direct my gaze out at the wide endless horizon, and my mouth would be wide open. I bet you when I was a child, I must have swallowed more flies than cornflakes. Looking back, I think I was almost old enough to vote before I learned that cornflakes and Wheaties didn't come with wings. Wow, James, what possessed you to write this play? Was it the influence of becoming a, an actor with and those skills, or did, did you feel like you just had something to say? Well, y yes, yes and no. But first of all, I, I, and this is, I really mean this in all sincerity, it is nothing but divine intervention. Yeah. Uh, because everyone knows who's worked with me and say, well, if I can't remember hello, let alone putting st <coughs> stringing three or four uh, paragraphs together. And this play has 38 pages of dialogue in which I can really essentially go through flawlessly. And, and that comes from our... Thank yeah. you, sir. I, I think so. But, but these are real stories. This is real to you. Well, well yeah, no. they're real from the imagination. Uh -huh. I mean, uh -huh. I, really, I, never, I never really knew my grandfather, uh -huh. but he becomes the, uh, the deus ex mechanica, so to speak. Mm -hmm. He becomes that, that, that force that... Uh, it, 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 I would like to take credit and say, well, I remember thinking about this in bed. Not so. It came to me. Right. Well, that's sometimes the way it works out. But yeah. to... to to confront when you've had, you, you knew about memorization that was difficult for you. You had, well, your first experience, you were telling me when you were doing this movie, you didn't even know not to look at the camera. Oh, the first, the, the first show that uh, when the guy approached me on the side, well, yeah. oh, my God, we shot it down in Bakersfield. I didn't know that you weren't supposed to look in the camera. <laughs> I didn't know you had to memorize that actors actually memorized all that dialogue and wow. that sort of stuff. There. Wow. And, and as a result, I was the worst actor in the worst play in, in the cheapest movie ever made. <laughs> yeah. you, you know? Oh, I, I've made uh, a couple of stinkers uh, in my you, time. I, I will match you. <laughs> bad, bad, okay, we we bad. should do that one night. That'd be uh, fun. Here's my bad, there's yours. Yeah. Uh, but when you take this play out, what's the audience reaction? They were, like most the of them are really astounded. And I think Variety's review uh, is just uh, really Well, amazing. come on, toot your own horn. I want to hear that. Well, but, they, they said so many incredible things that, uh, well, they start off with a word like prodigious. And that's, the, you know, wow. well, I had to go to the book department. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, and, uh, <laughs> and, and Variety has never really been that kind to me, but uh, 
Uh, it was amazing. But what, what, one of the things I, I hear so many, you know, it's awesome, it's this and that, and, and, and what, a, what, an, uh, what a memory. Sure. But the one thing a lady said to me, I, I was, you know, I was on my way to, uh, to say goodbye to uh, John Voigt, who introduced the, the, the play to, at the Brentwood Theater. I, I was going by to, 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 to say, to thank him. And the lady said, you know something, sir? It just makes you want to go out and hug a soldier. Nah, well, I, then the job is done. As well, as I, I hear that. You know, I'm a Navy dad twice over. Uh, my, my daughter... She probably meant sailor as well. Too. <laughs> same, same. <laughs> okay. You know, um, I, we sort of lost our way there in the 60s about honoring uh, the service to this country. And uh, thank God we've kind of come back. Because I know my my contemporaries, the Vietnam era mm -hmm, guys, mm -hmm. they took it on the chin when they oh, came absolutely. home, yeah. and and I'm sure they're part of your concern as well. Because your story well, is I, any sort I, of story. I, I deal with the Vietnam veterans. I really? start off with oh, with the, with the veterans from World War One. I. <laughs> I go all the way from World War One, the Korea, uh, to Vietnam, to uh, the war in Iraq, and all the way up to uh, today. Today, yeah. Yeah, we've got a shooting war going on here, and Amen. people yeah. people have to understand that. One of the things I really wanted to do, and I talked to a Medal of Honor recipient the other day, mm -hmm. uh, and it bothered me for a long time, the very fact that you were in war and that you took a life. Yeah. What does God think about that? Mm. You know what I mean? It gets a little heavy at some point. And then what what is this whole thing about redemption, or, or, or is it not? And can we be forgiven for our transgressions of the past? And wow. so I deal with that. And it's not to get, I'm not playing a holy role or, 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 or well, Joe Saint here. But it is an essential question. Uh, yeah. I mean, people, you know, it's defending something. And mm -hmm. sometimes that requires an act of violence. Uh, I always tell, Dennis Prager, who is a wonderful uh, philosopher, yeah. mm -hmm. the radio uh, personality here, says we have to remember that the translation out of the Ten Commandments, it doesn't say thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder. Mm. And there is a big distinction between those two things. Yeah, never uh, that. yeah that Dennis talks about this at length because mm -hmm. it is the needless taking of the life or the, mm -hmm. the life uh, uh, that you sacrifice for an unjust cause that would be wrong. So, and I'm sure in the addressing this, I know so many people in the service actually worry about that. And it's many times the cause for their silence. Well, when I heard uh, one of the Congressional Medal of Honor recipients say that how he is bothered by this, <laughs> and I told him that I was addressing that in the play, mm -hmm. then it, 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 it was almost sort of like relieved. I, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, there is often that sense of relief when your audience says, geez, I've been worried about this yes, for yes, ages. Yes, yes, yes. And now that you're getting to be, uh, you know, not exactly, I mean, don't let this useful exterior fool you. But, <laughs> I, I only mentioned 78 one time. <laughs> I always, but I know one guy that's older than I am, and he's still doing it too. Uh, you know, cool. Clint Eastwood. He's two weeks older than I am. There you go. So every time I see him, I call him an old man. <laughs> I love that. James, this has been really a treat for me, and, and you're a fascinating guy, and I Thank love you. your life story. I, I brought this along to show you that just uh, this week, I was by, United, by American Airlines, I was made an honorary captain of the flagship Liberty, which, uh, which means that anybody can get an occupation no matter what age. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thanks a lot to James McEachin for joining us today. I'm Paul Peterson for Aging in L.A. We'll see you next time.